hello, everyone. First of all, thank you all for joining uh, today to the session how CERN developers benefit from Kubernetes and CNCF landscape. Uh, my name is Antonio Anappi. I'm a computer engineer at CERN since 2015. I work daily with uh, Kubernetes and Java. Uh, as you can probably understand from my accent, I'm Italian, particularly from the place where the pizza was born, even though I promised to myself that I will try the Chicago one. Uh, <laughs> so, for the people that don't know what is CERN, CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. What we do, we st uh, study fundamental particles, how they interact in order to understand the fundamental laws of, uh, of nature. In order to do that, we build the largest particle accelerator in the world. We call it LHC, that Large Hadron Collider. It's a 27-kilometer ring underground, uh, in average more or less 100 meter depth. And it's also the place where the World Wide Web was invented. And uh, we like to say that it's a place where uh, we do science for, for peace. Because people from different countries, different cultural background, different religion, they all work together in a respectful uh, environment. And what we don't do, we don't do black holes, uh, as maybe you, you could see in, in movies or YouTube videos. Um, I mean, uh, the agenda of today, I'm just going to uh, first say what I do at CERN. Uh, what was our services running on VM models, and where were, which, were, which were, were our challenges, uh, which is now the architecture and uh, all the uh, techniques that we started to adopt since we moved to Kubernetes. So, uh, what, what I do at CERN? Uh, I'm in a team that is basically um, in charge of hosting critical Java applications for the CERN daily life, in particular in different fields, so finance, administration, engineering. Also, we host the single Xenon infrastructure of the whole CERN uh, that is based on uh, Kicklook. Uh, so, our users are mostly developers from different uh, departments, as I said, and uh, in, uh, identity and access uh, management engineers. Um, we run more or less more than 80 uh, applications, Java, mostly Java. Uh, we have uh, more than 3,000 pods, more than 400 nodes, Kubernetes nodes, and around 35, 36 clusters. Uh, how was our life when we were running these services on top of VMs? Uh, everything was working. There was no really reason or motivation because something was breaking that we had to move to Kubernetes. But, I mean, the memory can explain you easily why we, we decided to move to Kubernetes. We were wasting a lot of time in the repetitive and easy tasks uh, in order also to upgrade and provision new infrastructure and also to maintain custom scripts and puppet code to basically automate all our operation. This was taking us a lot of time and we could not do anything else. So, uh, I think one of the important aspects for us is that we are the kind of platform team uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this environment and uh, we work with a lot of developers. Usually the sides of the teams are pretty different um, and the only way to survive is through the automation. Uh, Another aspect for us really important is that infrastructure was hidden completely to developers. They don't have access to machine, to pods, or whatever. And they also don't have any power in terms of customization of the uh, running environments. This is a bit of timeline. We started to look at Kubernetes at the end of the 2015, uh, in, let's say, in the free time. Then we understood the, the potential and we decided to basically build uh, a production service on top of that. And in 2020, we basically moved uh, all our production uh, service on top of Kubernetes. That was not the end of the, of the journey, but actually the beginning of a new one, uh, because we started to adopt a lot of different technologies. We, had, we, threw, we went through a lot of migration, adoption of GitOps, and so on. Um, now, this I want to just show you a bit of uh, the current architecture that is running on Kubernetes. This is a, uh, a simplified version of our architecture. You see that we have uh, mainly one Kubernetes master cluster where we run all the tools that are used to manage all our infrastructure. So Argo CD, Argo Workflow, uh, Logstash Open Source, and uh, Prometheus. And then we have uh, a set of clusters and clusters where we actually run the application of the developers. Um, as you see, the, the, the cluster are a building block of our infrastructure, and we have a lot of them. And uh, the way we deploy is using the, um, at CERN, we don't have 
public cloud. We use a, a private cloud based on OpenStack. And there is a module called Magnum that allows us to provide a, a Kubernetes uh, service. And so basically we deploy um, Kubernetes cluster using this service uh, provided by another team at CERN. And all our Kubernetes cluster are basically uh, Terraform files inside the Git repo. And each time we want to create, update, or delete a cluster, we just do a commit, and then a Terraform pipeline uh, generate or update a, a cluster. We spend a lot of time also evaluating alternative to that, because is yes, Git-centric, but still not uh, like we would like uh, to be. Uh, for example, we look at cross-plane, uh, but the main issue was that there was no uh, plugin available for OpenStack. I remember I also gave a try to the TerraJet to, in order to generate, but it didn't really work. Uh, and also Cluster API, that actually this works, but the issue is that this is really only focused on Kubernetes cluster. Why we were looking for a solution that uh, was a bit generic, because still we have some uh, VMs to manage, and we would like to have... Uh, a technology like Terraform that could both manage Kubernetes cluster and VMs. Uh, one of the principles that we follow for the, the, for the cluster is the cl cluster as cattle. As I said, uh, each application is deployed in multiple cluster in multiple av availability zone. Then we put a cluster of load balancer in front of it to redirect traffic. Uh, why we use this paradigm? Because uh, first, each cluster is just an entity that we can easily replace with another one. Uh, users are isolated. So the uh, developers team have their own set of uh, clusters. So we increase security, basically isolating users from others. And it's extremely resilient because uh, we actually did this, this in the past, where basically the Kubernetes team in charge of basically the Magrum service accidentally killed the more than half of all production clusters. Uh, I think we had around 400 nodes, 250 nodes were gone. Uh, there was no downtime, no one could see anything, uh, because basically uh, two out of three production clusters were killed, but one survived. So we were basically for a few hours in integrated mode, but still uh, up and running. If we were just using one cluster, well, uh, that was just a matter of, class, of, of luck, we could just go down. Uh, but the fact that we have so many clusters is a maintenance overhead because you need to upgrade them to, and this, I mean, upgrading 40 clusters is, is a mess. Uh, that's why we started also to look at the virtual clusters with the vCluster to kind of consolidate some of those clusters in, uh, in virtual ones and to, uh, to, to, leave, uh, to, to have the same level of security, basically isolating users by uh, virtual clusters. Uh, one another important things of this architecture is the application deployment. Uh, we differentiate old way and new way, new way of deploy. In the past, we were used to have a, basically a JSON file that was describing all our infrastructure, Kubernetes clusters, application, uh, proxies, relationship be between them. This was the only um, source of truth for us. And basically, we had the custom script that was generating, get information from this JSON, and then put this, uh, tra translate those in, in uh, Kubernetes resources. So the developers were just going in the, on Argo workflow, run a, a job, and uh, deploy the application. The problem with that was that every time there was a, a change in the configuration, we had to trigger again this pipeline with restart of the, uh, of the application, bringing some downtime. That was kind of mitigated from the fact that application were uh, ac across different clusters. Uh, we started to, with our users, a new process, a new way to actually let them to deploy, that is based on GitOps. And basically the difference is that our uh, source of truth is, is not anymore our JSON, but a, a Git repository, where they define the Elm charts and the Kubernetes resource they have. Uh, Argo CD is in charge of basically reconciliate all the time what is in Git with what is in the cluster. And basically, if there is an update of small, minimal part of the configuration, this, not, this does not require a start of the application. Uh, this way, we empower the users, and I mean, this gives us a bit more, uh, give them a bit more flexibility, us a bit more time, but also a lot of new challenges that I will explain a bit later. Uh, this is how it looks like instead the monitoring infrastructure. You see there are different layers of uh, our monitoring. There is a, a, a bottom part that is basically all the Kubernetes cluster hosting the um, uh, Java application. 
that have a Prometheus that is volatile. So it's gathering uh, uh, all the metrics for all the Java applications deployed there and publish them. And then those ones are federated with uh, another layer, the middle one. Basically, we call it the central Prometheus cluster for each developer team, developer's team. And this actually has a state because basically all the metrics are stored in Mimir. And also, all the configuration of Prometheus and Alert Manager at this level is managed again via Git. So you, uh, developers are via Git, they can publish, uh, they can uh, commit uh, uh, recording rules, uh, alerting rules, and uh, this then get uh, configured on the Kubernetes cluster. And then the latest layer is basically our uh, Prometheus that is federating all the others. It's just to, a way for us to have an overall uh, overview of, the, uh, of all metrics and also to set alerts. So as soon as we get issue somewhere, we, we, we are aware. Last thing is the login system is pretty simple. Uh, basically, each Apache Tomcat has a Fluent D side container that ship logs to uh, Elastic, uh, sorry, to Logstash, and then Logstash send them this, this to, um, to open, uh, open search. Again, the configuration is fully managed via Git and Argo CD. Uh, one recurrent team of our uh, infrastructure is GitOps. So we really manage all our infrastructure via Git repository, via commit. Uh, what is GitOps? Um, GitOps is basically an approach where Git is used as a, a source of truth of everything. Everything is declarative. Application, infrastructure, they are all defined in Git as a YAML. And there is this, I mean, it's nothing completely new compared to the past, but the, the, the main difference from the past is that the continuous recon reconciliation concept. In the past, you, you, see, you saw this with our Terraform, you were just uh, pushing the commit and then the cluster was created, but there was never any sync phase between what was running and what was in Git. While, we, uh, to, thanks to the GitOps controller, uh, the, what is in Git is constantly checked and synchronized with what is in the, in the cluster. Why we started to adopt those things is because we get all the advantages of Git, basically tracking and versioning. Uh, it's really easy to ro roll back. You just revert the comment, and then you, you, you come back to the previous situation. And then also this put in place a formalized review process. Uh, when you commit something, this goes through a pipeline that validates the change. And then if it's needed, there is a human, depends on the criticality of, the, of the, the piece of infrastructure, there is a human person that actually validate again the, the things and accept or not the match request. This is our current infrastructure. Basically, we have only one Argo CD that is managing everything. It's managing our monitoring log infrastructure, the jobs, current jobs infrastructure uh, itself, and also other Argo CD uh, instances. Those instances are used by the, our developers in order to deploy changes uh, for, for, uh, for example, like recording and alerting rules or for updating their application that are running now in GitOps. Now, uh, there are a lot of nice books about GitOps and uh, things uh, uh, about concept, but there is not really golden rules how to implement it. And I mean, we started this within 2020 and it was even worse than today. And I think I struggle a lot to really understand and to find an optimal solution, at least for us. What I understood is that there is no golden rules. Usually it depends on what you run and how you run it. Um, for example, one thing that we did was to using, using a, a naming convention. Basically, we have tons of uh, uh, repositories with a suffix. Usually, we distinguish repository by sources, so they all gather sources in terms of M chart, customized, pure YAML, JSONnet, and then we have other repository that we call it uh, uh, Dash application that only contain uh, Argo CD application. And there, there we have application set, and also we implement a lot of this concept of app of apps uh, that is, I mean, this comes with the Argo CD. Um, as you can see, we use the approach of having multiple repositories instead of one, because this way we could isolate uh, use cases and users. The problem is that when you have so many repositories, it's really hard to follow which repositories does what, in particular if you don't work with these things every day. Um, another thing that we decided to, to, to implement is to use the single branch instead of multiple ones. 
because this facilitates. You just commit a, a change in, water, in one branch, and then this gets propagated everywhere. The, the bad things of this, if you just match something wrongly, then you can kill all your uh, infrastructure easily. It happened once to me that uh, I, I was playing with Prometheus uh, sources and I accidentally merged something to master that was not supposed, and I killed all the Prometheus systems all, all over the clusters. Uh, it took me <laughs> a while to figure out and also to realize that I, I did that, uh, because of course, bringing down my in monitoring infrastructure, also the alerting went down, so I could not actually see it. Uh, but then rolling back bro brought back everything. Um, GitOps is really nice, gives us a lot of, uh, I mean, flexibility, also uh, help us to automatize a lot, but also brings a lot of challenges. One of the biggest one for us is the secret management. There are mostly two, two philosophies. Um, you can store your secret in Git, in encrypted. This way is nice because you have basically the, 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 the secret together with the, your deployment. Uh, but requires a lot of maintenance because first you need to care about key rotation. So every time you update the private key, you need to re-encrypt all the secrets in all the repositories. It may require some additional components in the infrastructure. If you think about sealed secrets, it requires to have some components in the Kubernetes cluster that maybe you don't want to, uh, to, to install because also they consume resources. And uh, a commit, so basically if you have this a secret uh, in different uh, repositories, for any reason, then you have to do a commit on all of them. And this, you see, this is, does really scale well. The other solution is to have basically an external store where basically in Git you only have a placeholder to the, uh, to the Git secret. So for us at least it's good because we delegate this operation to, to another expert team. So they care about rotate keys, uh, backup of the secrets and so on. You change the password in one, only one place. You update the place in the standard store, uh, in the standard store, and then Argo CD will automatically update the secret in all the clusters. But it creates an external dependencies that at the runtime is not a big deal because once you deploy everything, that's fine. But in case of disaster recovery, uh, this external storage becomes a, a, a big dependency that we need to, to have it to, to recover. So our solution was basically to go for the second one. So we have an external store that is uh, sense specific that we, we invented that we call Teji. Uh, how we actually uh, talk to this is using the Argo CD Vault plugin. That is, uh, I mean, this is open source tool um, that is widely used in the Argo CD community. But we basically implement our own code to work with our uh, external store. store. But since this is a kind of uh, ad hoc solution that we use at Sen, we want to uh, actually move to something more standard. So that's why we start to plan to move uh, everything to Vault. But we actually hold on at some point because everything was ready, but then there was a license update. So we are still evaluating which is the impact and deciding based on that. In general, what, what I see is that in the CNCF landscape is really missing a tool that uh, do, does uh, secret management. Um, then, another challenge is, is security. Um, as I said, in the old model, developers didn't have too much permission. They could not do anything. Now, they have access to the infrastructure. They can customize Kubernetes objects. They can define their own images. And uh, they can download whatever from the internet and then basically create a, a security breach in our Kubernetes clusters. So we, we have to find a balance between how improve their experience, user experience, and how we can actually make sure that everything is secure and, uh, and um, controlled. Uh, a way that we uh, started to, a way to mitigate this, first is to sit down with developers and agree on some policies. So telling them, look, okay, we are okay that you provide uh, Docker images, but first you use our uh, base images, uh, don't you run as root and things like that, use a private registry. Of course, talking is not enough, and you need to enforce those policies, and that's why we started to implement this with OPA, uh, with in particular Gatekeeper that is running for Kubernetes. The issue with that is that is mostly for the syntax, because it's just this funny rego syntax that is a bit of a nightmare sometimes. So that's why we also started to look at the Kiverno, because it's pure YAML and is specific for Kubernetes. And in general, in the context of security, as I said before, the cluster as cattle paradigm helps a lot because we isolate uh, users by, by cluster. Another uh, of the challenges of this GitOps is that we miss completely a full picture. As I said before, 
um, you can easily uh, get confused. You don't know which repositories defines what. And for if you have new people that join the team and have to, I don't know, even run a pod, they got uh, completely lost because which repository should I commit? Where, where I should go for doing this? Um, the way we are trying to, this, to, to mitigate this is first using name, naming convention and to label all the Kubernetes objects so we, we know where they come from. But also, since we have only one Argo CD that is managing everything, we would like to basically to query API, extract all the information, and put them in a way that is easily queryable uh, via, I don't know, JSON or, or JQ uh, scripts. Now, in order to, to finish, uh, which is our feelings after a few years of, uh, of production? Uh, operation. Uh, before Kubernetes, we were really busy with, uh, with a lot of simple repetitive tasks. Um, after Kubernetes, we increased a lot of our efficiency and productivity. And this gave us the possibility to focus on other projects. For example, when I started, I said, we historically always run uh, this hosting uh, platform for Java application, but recently we started to run the uh, key clock infrastructure uh, because we had the, the Kubernetes experience. Our colleagues from the um, key clock, they just wanted to use uh, Kubernetes to deploy. So they asked us to take over. And this was only possible because we were less busy than the past. Uh, in the past, when we were creating a new infrastructure environment for a new application, it was taking days to sometimes even a week to configure everything. Now it takes really few hours. Uh, another big advantage is that in the past, uh, applications were getting just stuck. Uh, so it was not crashing, it was getting st stuck for any reason, and the load balancer was anyway uh, redirecting end users to those, uh, those clusters. Um, and only human in intervention could actually fix this issue. Uh, with Livinus Readiness Probe in Kubernetes, we actually uh, implemented health check. We actually started to cut off the, the pod that were kind of stuck or not working, and then kill them with Livinus Probe. In this way, we just kept getting a, a new, completely environment that was just working. And this was is now completely transparent for, for end users. Configuration and tracking. Um, uh, in, in the past, even though we had everything in Puppet and with automated script, there was always someone that connecting to a VM, uh, push, do some changes and making things fixing like that. Then after two years, you were just replacing the VM with the new OS and then the things were not working. Why? Because basically someone did those changes manually. With Kubernetes, this is not possible. We always, first because Kubernetes is mutable, and uh, we always know what, which uh, Docker images are running and which tag. Automation. Uh, we were doing also a lot of automation before, but we had a lot of uh, custom scripts that uh, we implemented. Now we started to adopt a lot of uh, multiple CNCF tools with a wider community. So uh, if we have any issue, uh, we, we can ask, we can get uh, uh, help. That was not the case with our custom scripts. At the same time, we can also be part of that and contribute with, with our work. Uh, user flexibility uh, in the past was basically minimal. There was no, they could not, have, they didn't have any power. Uh, nowadays, instead, it's the opposite. So we actually delegate to them simple tasks like, I don't know, defining alerting rules in Prometheus. Why we, they should open a ticket with us to ask us to, to add a new alerting rule while they could do themselves. Um, of course, this, as I said before, comes with some drawback uh, in terms of security. And then disaster recovery and business continuity. Uh, I mentioned before this incident that uh, uh, we were basically affected, where basically 250 nodes were killed. If I have to think in the VM world that 250 VMs were just killed from a day to, to another, it will take, I think, weeks to recover everything. Uh, while in that case, for us, it took literally a few hours, a couple of hours to bring back everything, and so to be again uh, in a production state. Now, uh, take away, um, we are extremely happy of our journey, even though this is not finished and actually is always evolving. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to keep up with all the new tools and things around that are uh, happening. 
One day you use Prometheus, and the day after there is open telemetry, so it's, it's pretty hard. We can say that there is a more reliable service than the past, and this was not coming from us, but actually from developers. I can say that Kubernetes helped us a lot to increase platform, uh, increase the team productivity and efficiency. Uh, we could actually shift our attention to other tasks, then, uh, and, and I also implement new things. And we also replace a lot of ad hoc solution with uh, with standard approaches. Uh, this way is much easier to enroll new people. Uh, while before, people were not willing to work with us because maybe we were using some <laughs> fancy Perl script from the 20 years ago. So, but now we use a lot of new stack, so we can find also easily new person that are expert on, on these fields. And I mean, doesn't it make any sense to reinvent the wheel? While there is uh, such a big uh, community that has more or less the same issue that we have, why don't profit of uh, the work of all, all, all of them? Uh, of course, this migration, this journey to Kubernetes and the GitOps was not easy at all. Uh, first of all, the documentation. Uh, I've been using a lot of uh, tools from the CNCF landscape. One common uh, <laughs> factor was the fact that documentation is always the last things to be updated. So really, a lot of time I had to go to the source code of the tool, checking to understand if I was doing something wrong or was actually the, the, a bug in, in, the, in the tool. And this is not optimi optimal. Um, plus, uh, in, in different versions of the, those tools, there were a lot of breaking change, changes. For example, in Argo CD, at least I remember between version 1.8 and 2.3, it was a nightmare. Every uh, upgrade was basically a breaking change that was taking a, a lot of to migrate the application from a version to another. Now this is getting more mature and, and much better. I, I could basically update uh, two versions without problem, without breaking anything. But in the past, this was happening quite often. I mean, I, I mentioned Argo CD because it's one of the tools that I, I use most, but this happened often with other tools as well. And then last things, but not, not least, uh, we had to spend a lot of effort in convincing first developers, but also other colleagues, that the direction that we took was the right one. When you have something that is running and working, even though it's time consuming, is not extremely efficient, the people ask you why I should just change uh, something that is running? Uh, why I should just risk to break everything to, to, to innovate? Uh, I think one this sentence that I found online was really explicative of the, a lot of people want progress, but they don't like changes. And this is what we face every day, still now. Uh, I see a lot of colleagues that when you mention Kubernetes and that you run in production, they just start to yell like, are you crazy? You're running Kubernetes, uh, uh, your services on production on Kubernetes. So <laughs> this is kind of a, a fight every day. Um, and also, since we had to convince those people, all the changes that we did in these, two, uh, in these years were uh, we tried to do them in phases. First, we, we moved to Kubernetes, then we started to adopt, uh, uh, we moved for, to everything to Kubernetes, but using the same technology stack from the VM. And this was a nightmare. Then we started to move um, to new technology stack be because we get the feedback from developers that, okay, we are on Kubernetes, so everything looks good, so you can go ahead. Then we started to update the technology stack and they start to see the benefits of that with Prometheus and so on. And then we start to move again to GitOps, but all this happening in, in phases and make our work extremely harder and slow. If I could go back, maybe I would just go in one, in one shot, but I, I believe that this will not, will not be possible because um, it's also a lot of human interaction and convincing people that you are doing the right things. And as soon as you do something bad, they will come back to you asking why you did that while before everything was working. So this is, I think, is the biggest challenges in this world today, for, for us at least. And that's it from my side. Thank you all for, for the attention. And if you have any questions, please. Any question? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, 
Uh, not I mean, the question was if you, when containerize the application, we see any performance issue. Uh, we never have said, see any uh, performance issue. Also because, I mean, these applications are web applications, so they don't have a really high criticality in terms of performance. So we don't do I.O. or things like that. So there was no difference at all. Um, in our uh, so the question is if uh, these, these clusters that we have are for the accelerator controls, uh, not because we are focused on the part of more IT side. We work with developers, but then I, I think they recently start in the accelerator sector to use a Kubernetes cluster. Well, they are <coughs> planning to do it. Uh, we will probably collaborate and try to help because I mean we have this expertise, and I know that someone in in my group is already working with them. So. This is happening. Uh, we are getting more and more experiments, accelerators, people that want to run this in Kubernetes. The question is which uh, Kubernetes version we are, we are using. Uh, now we are on 125. Uh, the thing is that we are uh, bind to the version that is provided with Magnum. It's not dependent on us. So <clears throat> recently, uh, the team provided also 127, but as, I mean, we need a bit of time to, to plan it because updating, sorry, <coughs> 40 cluster, it will take a while because also every time we upgrade the cluster, we also upgrade all the components. So Argo CD, Prometheus, and we need to validate everything. Thank you all for, for joining and for the attention, for your time. Have a good drink. <laughs> <laughs>